Hello, everyone. I will be talking about entanglement distillation to you. And what you see here on the first slide is sort of a cartoon version of the experiment that I'm going to present. So in our experiment, we will have two network nodes comprising one diamond, and each diamond hosts two qubits. We then generate two entangled states between these diamonds, and then use these as input states for our distillation protocol, which ideally will give us a state of higher fidelity afterwards. Now, I come from the Netherlands, or well, at least I work there, I don't really come from there, and uh, what you see here is a schematic map of the Netherlands and also a schematic of our ambition. What we aim to do at QTech in Delft is to build a primer for a quantum internet that comprises four Dutch cities and spans macroscopic distances. And on such a quantum network, we will be able to do things like blind and distributed quantum computation, device-independent key distribution, metrology applications, quantum re repeaters, you name it. And in order to achieve this, we run a collaborative effort between experimentalists, theorists, material scientists, and engineers. If we take our quantum internet and put it on a more conceptual level, then we get the following constituents. So we will need communication qubits that actually send photons from one node to another and establish entangled states, but we also want to run more complex protocols. And for this, we will actually need some form of memory register to store more entangled states. And this also means that we need some form of, say, interface between our communication qubit and our memories. And these three requirements are the main reason why we bank on nitrogen vacancy <coughs> centers in diamond. These are atom-like atom defects that are fluorescent and they have the following advantageous properties. So at low temperatures, they have a spin-selective optical interface with which you can polarize the spin and read it out with very high efficiency. In our devices, we actually find coherence times of a second routinely. And I guess an important advantage of this type of system is that you get additional qubits for free. Yeah, so in the diamond, there are additional nuclear spins surrounding the NV center, and we can use those as a resource. So these will be our memories. And finally, the NV Center has already proven to be a very versatile and convenient system when you try to create remote entanglement between two NV Centers. Now, of course, we're not entirely done, so I will present a little bit of a to-do list, I guess, in the following. So in the future, we want to encapsulate our NV Centers in optical cavities. This will ideally give us an increase of our entangling rate by three orders of magnitude. And there have already been very promising results in the groups of Patrick Maletinsky and Richard Warburton at the University of Basel this year. Additionally, our network nodes will be separated by tens of kilometers. And in order to avoid photon loss in the optical fibers, we will have to downconvert the emission of the NV center to the telecom band. And also here, there have already been very promising results in the group of Christoph Becher at the University of the Saarland. But so there's one conceptual thing that we still have to overcome. Whenever we have created entanglement between our two NV centers, we only used NV centers as a coherent resource. We never considered the memories surrounding them during our entangling protocols. And this is what we're going to do in this talk. In this talk, we're going to extend our network functionality to multi-qubit network nodes. And how do we wire our quantum internet up? Well, typically, we have two diamonds, each hosting one NV center, and via the optical interface here that is spin selective, we generate spin photon entanglement. So the spin of the NV center is entangled with the photon, and the photonic wave packet then travels towards this beam splitter here in the center, it interferes, and is subsequently detected by a detector. If we then forward the heralding of a detection event to our NV centers, we obtain a perfectly entangled state. Well, that's not entirely true. So uh, in the real world, there are a few losses. Say um, our NV center emits into 4 pi, and we can't pick up all the radiation from the NV, and so therefore we can't pick up all the photons that are being emitted. Additionally, the optical path length, that is the distance between the NV center and the beam splitter here in the center, drifts over time due to acoustic vibrations. So really what we get if we detect a single photon after running the sequence is the following type of state. Yeah? So this is a mixed state 
that has an entangled state contribution with a phase here in the subscript that is unknown due to these acoustic vibrations. And additionally, because of the losses, we can't tell whether we had a single or a two-photon event when we detect a single photon, because in the process, one of the two photons might have gone lost, and our two NV centers are in the bright state. Now, this can be overcome, this problem of having these very mixed states. And one particular example is that we have two of these states. Now, that doesn't really help you initially, but you can sort of equate them to a certain type of beer, yeah? And this is not very really analogy between alcohol and entanglement ends, because I can take my beer, put it into a distillery, and out comes a lower quantity of high quality whiskey. Yeah, and the same holds for entangled states. Yeah? This protocol is called entanglement distillation. And if we have two of these states, one of our, on our NV centers and one on our nuclear spin memories, then we can take these two beer bottles, put it into our quantum distillery, and out comes a high quality entangled state. Yeah, in our case, the distillery consists of local operations, measurements, and classical communication. Now, there have already been implementations of these protocols in the early 2000s with uh, photons that were post-selected on fourfold coincidences and with trapped ions where all four ions were situated in a single trap. What we do with this experiment is that we bring entanglement distillation in a deterministic way onto a quantum network where we really use remote entangled states. And in order to do this, we have to marry these two concepts, yeah? our nuclear spin quantum register and the generation of entangled states. So what I will do in the following, I will give you a brief overview of the things that you need to know about these two key components and how they work together. So for the remote entanglement generation, we run the following sequence on our NV centers. It consists of laser and microwave pulses. We start out with a optical pumping pulse that initializes the NV center into a well-defined state. We then continue with a microwave pulse that puts it into a superposition. This Gaussian pulse up here excites the NV center and creates our spin photon entanglement. And the last microwave pi pulse is there to mitigate coherence due to quasi-static magnetic field drift. And so we do this many times. That's why I put this in brackets and exponentiate it to the power of n, because our, as I said, our detection efficiency is not perfect. On the side of the nuclear spins, we have to understand the following concept. The NV center couples to these nuclear spins via magnetic hyperfine interaction. And that is an interaction that is always on. In a simple picture, you can view it such that it depends on the NV center state what magnetic field the nuclear spin feels. Yeah? So if the NV center is in the state zero, then the nuclear spin only feels our externally applied magnetic field and just feels the bare Lamour frequency, this omega naught. However, if the NV center flips its state, then we get an alternate, slightly varied frequency, omega 1, that uh, depends on the coupling parameters between the two. And what this means is that we have to keep track of the NV center state while we store states in the nuclear spins in order to accommodate this change of precession frequency and keep track of the phase. Now, this works quite well for our entangling sequence, except for one bit. And that is this process here, this optical pumping scheme, is somewhat probabilistic. So again, what we do here is we shine in a laser that pumps all population from state one into state zero. And this actually happens via a relatively complicated excited state level structure. And you can see that there is some probabilistic way that the state of the NV center trickles down towards zero. So we don't have a deterministic evolution of the NV center spin state. And this, in turn, Defaces the nuclear spin because it feels different precession frequencies here. And you can also see naively that if the difference between these two precession frequencies is small, then our nuclear spin is more resilient. So we studied this in a, 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 a paper that came out last year, where we sort of look at the resilience of the nuclear spins as a function of this coupling strength to the NV center. And in this talk, we sort of use a, a nuclear spins in an intermediate regime that are coupled weakly to the NV center, yet still give us very high control fidelities. And we can actually check the resilience of our nuclear spin memories just by initializing them into a state of our liking, performing multiple entangling attempts on the NV center, and then reading out the nuclear spin state. So if we do this with both our 
quantum network nodes, then we see that the noise that we obtain is mainly the phasing noise as predicted. So the eigenstates remain well defined, whereas states on the equatorial plane of the blosphere deface. If I depict this as a function of the number of entangling attempts, then you can see that we have still good memories for about 100 entangling attempts. And this actually suffices to keep on going with our distillation experiment. So I cut this up into four conceptual steps. We first start our sequence by generating remote entanglement between our two NV centers. So both sit in separate cryostats that are separated by two meters. If we detect the photon, we take our entangled state and swap it via local operations onto our nuclear spin memories. We then continue to generate another remote entangled state. And if that succeeds within the first 50 trials, then we perform our distillation protocol and get out a state of higher fidelity, ideally. So I'm sort of looking at this protocol from a very abstract plane. If you want to get into the details of what the experimental setup looks like or what kind of quantum operations we have to perform, then I'm happy to talk to you after this talk or uh, implore you to look up the reference up here. So with this, I'd like to come to the results of our experiment. In our experiment, we are actually able to change the initial raw input state via this parameter alpha here. Yeah, so if alpha is small, then we have a lot of entanglement in our admixture with an unknown phase. And if alpha is large, then our state is mainly separable. And if we then record the fidelity with our ideal entangled state, then we obtain such a state fidelity for the raw input state. But please note that we have no access to the coherences of the entangled state, in this case, due to the unstabilized phase. Yeah, so we can actually characterize parameters independently and come up with a model that actually puts the state fidelity of our raw input state up here on this line. If we then perform our swap operation, we introduce a bit more infidelity, such that the state fidelity ends up down here. We then create another state. And um, <clears throat> finally, we have our two beer bottles. Yeah? And what we want to do now is we want to actually get our whiskey out. Yeah? And ideally, our whiskey has a higher fidelity. And it turns out that that is the case. So in a regime of relatively large alphas so or relatively large separable admixture, the output state fidelity overcomes the input fidelity of the two initial states, thus providing distillation. At the last point of this uh, talk, I want to talk a little bit about this internal phase. As Ian just mentioned in one of his answers, you can actually stabilize this phase and access the internal coherences of the states. And we do so by actually making a Marzenda interferometer where we have here a beam splitter. The diamonds are sort of our mirrors. The light interferes here, is detected, goes on to a microcontroller, and then gets forwarded as a PID signal to a fiber stretcher that stabilizes the phase of our interferometer such that we can access these entangled states. And now we only rely on a single click to actually entangle our two NV centers, and this vastly increases our entangling rate. We now achieve entangling rates of up to 40 hertz. And as you may remember, we have coherence times of about a second. So what we can do now is we can convert this process of entanglement generation that is probabilistic into a deterministic one. And what we do here is we perform several trials of uh, entanglement generation until we succeed. And once we succeed, we hold on to the state until we deliver it at a certain point in time. So and if you concatenate this process, then you actually deliver entanglement sort of on a clock, if you wish, in a deterministic fashion. With this, I'd like to come to the end and give you a brief summary. Um, so we, in this talk, we've extended our network node functionalities to multiple qubits by incorporating nuclear spins. We've then used these multi-qubit nodes to perform entanglement distillation. And we already have quite a few ideas how to improve the performance of the system to actually extend our network in the future to multiple NV centers and multiple memories per node. With this, I'd like to thank everybody back in Delft and you for your attention. Thank you.